Ah, here's Bob. Good to see you, Bob. <laughs> He's still connecting. Hi, Tom. Good, to good morning, you. good morning. There's Bob. Good morning, Bob. Okay, cool. Aries is not good. Okay, uh, uh, good morning and uh, to American colleagues and uh, uh, good afternoon to our uh, European colleagues and uh, good evening to Asia colleagues. Uh, this is Paul Liu from NC State. Uh, maybe this is the first time I see my name in the talk series. Okay, uh, today uh, we invite Professor V. Jin Tsai from University of Delaware come here talk about carbon cycle and flux in the world. A lot of river uh, impacted, just like a river dominated the ocean margins and particularly focused on in organic part, carbon part. So before I introduce Vijin, and so I would like to say, oh, today's talk is uh, 23, 23rd, 20, the number 23rd in 2021. Overall, plus the last year, so far we have uh, 55, 55 uh, talks and all in the you know, uh, uh, YouTube channel archived there, uh, also in the uh, Billy Billy station. So feel free to use it for, for, you, uh, uh, for your teaching, your research, your group discussion. It's wonderful resources. And uh, also next week, next Wednesday, uh, Brandy from uh, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, she, uh, she was a former student of Jeff uh, uh, Nietzsche, working on the uh, Yellow River Delta. Uh, she also will compare the Yellow River and the Mississippi River uh, folks on the Delta Deltic Loop. And also next Friday, so I think uh, it's also very interesting to the group audience here because Bernard from Woods Hole, uh, he will come here talk about uh, the Mississippi River, but uh, uh, he's a guy organized the Global River Observation Network and covered so many large rivers uh, across the globe. So please mark your calendar, also talk about in organic. So, <laughs> um, so uh, Wei Jing now is a, a professor and also a chair professor. Is a Mary uh, last, uh, how to say this, uh, Lathap or Lassa? Lahap, okay, chair professor. And as we mentioned in the University of Delaware, and Vijin got his uh, bachelor from Xiamen University. We know Xiamen and also a master from Ocean University of China. We also know this school and also PhD from uh, Scripps. And after that, uh, postdoc at Wuzho for uh, two years and then uh, assistant professor at uh, UGA, the University of Georgia, and then after some years and shifted to uh, University of Delaware. So uh, things I want to point out, uh, Vijin uh, was an AGU fellow, started 2017, and also this year, I think maybe a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago, uh, he just become a fellow of the Geochemical Society in the European uh, Association of Geochemistry and a couple other uh, award and, uh, you know, uh, even the uh, Young Scientist Award. So uh, uh, one thing I point out, we published uh, many, uh, many, many papers. And uh, if you look at uh, his citation, so now it's almost uh, 15,000. And as you can see, every year citation is around uh, more than 2,000. I think uh, within 10 years, we dream, you will more than 35,000. So that's a really, really, very good. So I think now uh, uh, let's uh, we I'll give the floor to you, Vijin. Please uh, sh uh, share your screen for the presentation mode. Am I sharing already or not? No, not yet, not yet. Okay, so I needed to exit to this before I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, right, okay. I will share screen. Uh, okay, share screen and let me click presentation mode yeah. and click uh, duplicate. <laughs> okay, so now it's good, right? Yeah, very good. And I put my laser point. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to 
to you out there, and uh, I trust you are all doing very well. Uh, first, I want to thank Paul for inviting me to give this talk and uh, for the very kind words he just said about me. Uh, I think Paul has done a great service to the community for organizing this uh, Source to Think uh, webinar series. I have attended a few this year and uh, watched more on uh, uh, YouTube video. And, and I really like that. And I think it's one, it will be one of the few good memory of this difficult time. So today I'm going to talk about carbon cycle, CO2 flux, hypoxia, and uh, ocean acidification in large river impact the ocean margins. This may be deviate away a little bit from more sediment uh, uh, kind of talk, river, this is related of course. Uh, I, and and uh, I will first give an introduction about a global carbon cycling, CO2 uptake flux in coastal waters and ocean margins. And this will be like all introduction supposed to do to talk a little bit of background and set up a stage for what uh, we're gonna talk today. And uh, I will do that, but I will go a step further to talk a little bit about my research. This is partly to satisfy our uh, seminar host, uh, so folks on the uh, source to think talk. And second is also because partly when we locked at home for a year and uh, somehow maybe you can call that a COVID syndrome and uh, I, I just want to talk, but uh, I promise not to take the too long. So the Main part uh, of this talk is about carbon cycling hypoxia acidification in the two ocean margins of Changjiang and the Mississippi River. And uh, summary. So when we talk about CO2, we always start with atmosphere. So the red color is atmospheric CO2. It has been changing, you know, in the past regularly between interglacial and glacial between 280 and 190 ppm regularly over the last few uh, glacial interglacial cycle. And ever since the last uh, uh, glacial maximum, it increased rapidly. Of course, that rapidly means a few thousand years and uh, approaching 280 before the industrial revolution and stabilized there for a while. And then since uh, uh, industrial revolution that increases rapidly and uh, accelerating after 1950s. Now this is what uh, I got from ki taking Keeling's class in fall of 1988. And this is exactly from Keeling's handout from his class. And uh, I still remember vividly when Keeling came into the room, he said this point was measured uh, last week. And if you excited, uh, as a student uh, to be part of the climate change research, right? And uh, after de-seasonalized data, Keating can tell you all the wiggles. And, and he, his, the question I remember uh, clearly, he will ask student, you know, because when you de-seasonalize the uh, rate of CO2 increase exchanges around 1973, he'll ask student, what happened? Do you still remember, you know, what happened in the world? And of course there was a oil embargo that changes the rate of CO2 release a little slow after that. And people are wondering this year after the uh, pandemic, if there's a CO2 decrease, well, very small so far. Um, but anyway, that was then in 1988, CO2 in the atmosphere was 350. And now we are at this 415 level and that was 88. And we know that most of this CO2 increase is due to fossil fuel use and land uh, fossil fuel use and cement production and uh, land use changes. And about 45% uh, 45% of that CO2 release stays in the atmosphere. It's actually pretty stable. And the rest goes to the ocean and the uh, terrestrial biosphere. 
Now for years, actually this number, the terrestrial people don't really estimate that number. It's a difference between the release from fossil fuel, land use, and stays, what stays in the atmosphere, what goes to the ocean. The difference, what is they call it, the residual land sink. And only very, in, in recent years, terrestrial people are able to do their own estimate. Now for our ocean, oceanography, we complain about ocean, well, not complain, we say ocean have tremendous heterogeneity, but compared with terrestrial system, we are not that heterogeneous, right? So we can estimate with much greater confidence what, how much CO2 is taken into the ocean than the terrestrial people. But this is a traditional view about anthropogenic CO2, so there's no change, you know, close talk here, or at least not changing. Now, in 2013, uh, Pierre Renier published this paper. He add another pathway. Essentially, when you have another pathway, really you have to still keep the mass balance. So you just increase this, and then there is a leaking pipe. Let's see to come back to the atmosphere. The good example is Amazon River, when you know with huge CO2 uh, feel, uh, feed by the terrestrial biomass, right? And but when uh, what a river flows to the ocean and lots of CO2 goes back to atmosphere. There is a small amount goes to the ocean. Now, it's not that we don't know there is a flux from, from uh, terrestrial to the ocean. This is about anthropogenic CO2. So this has to be something over the natural part. So we know there is a river to ocean flux, but we believe we know it well, and we assume there's no increase in this part of the flux. During my talk, this is probably the only slides only listed in anthropogenic CO2. Most of my flux are contemporary, contemporary current measured data, okay? So here with the contemporary, we, um, know from Takahashi's compile, ocean takes up about 1.5 petagram carbon each year. And 20 years ago, when I started this, it was we don't really know the size of continental shelf CO2 uptake. Um, Tsunagai published a paper in 1999 uh, 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 based on the East China Sea study, put this number as one petagram and we you know, that's not possible that large, but uh, uh, over the last uh, 20 years, and in particular due to El Bodo Borges work, he actually, uh, this was the first global synthesis to put estrogen CO2, estrogen as a source released to the atmosphere and the shelf and almost parallel, I did a work uh, and did a synthesis of continental shelf use so-called province-based synthesis. That is, you use a number and, and you know put a category and you know, with a represented uh, flux for that category of margin and extrapolate globally. I came up a number about continental shelf take up a CO2 about a 0.22 and, and around that 0.25 in this paper. And since then, there are several other global synthesis paper did a much nice, much better job. And the number is roughly about 0.2 now, and some even seems move lower, but I think a ballpark of 0.2 pentagram is a good number. Continental shelf is a sink of CO2 and the estuary is a source. This part, we still have a large uncertainty there. And as I will mention uh, soon, that large S string seems, you know, most of these data are based on smaller S string measured in Europe and other places, but the large S string clearly changes the picture. So the coastal ocean is an important link between land, open ocean, and atmosphere. And when I started this work many years ago, our question was are coastal oceans source or sink of CO2? And now it's not that much of a question anymore. We know shelf is a sink and estuary is a source. And the question really turns into how big is the you know, source or sink and what is the variability uh, of 
regional and global variability, and this is always relevant what a process can choose the CO2 balance. And a recent paper I want to talk about is that, which shows just published this year in GBC uh, by Kwan and all, and uh, which some present for us a traditional view that river and uh, you know, groundwater maybe, and margin to deliver about 0.9 petagram carbon into the ocean and ocean takes up a, you know, sedimentation, uh, varies about 0.2 petagram. So about 0.7 is going to release back to the atmosphere and ocean take about a 2.3 petagram carbon, this is anthropogenic carbon. So the net carbon is about 1.6. This is what when you go to read Taro Takahashi's paper, at the end, they always say, okay, we assume there is this pre-industrial release back to atmosphere. So this total anthropogenic CO2 is 2.3. Now that part, everyone just take that, okay? And, and, and there is no real proof that is right. So uh, this paper shows, uh, suggests at, at least, okay? The export is much larger total about 1.4 petagram carbon from river and from coastal zone, um, marshes, wetland, and groundwater. Overall, about 1.4. Now, you still need to keep the mass balance of the ocean, right? That doesn't change. So the main point here is this uh, actually, so there is this uh, overall release is much greater from, uh, ocean to the atmosphere, but the, and the, the anthropogenic CO2 take is about still 2.3, but he, she separated that into two terms, the coastal ocean uptake and open ocean uptake. However, the net ocean uptake is actually quite a lot smaller. And how do we make that? You know, because observed CO2 uptake is larger, so about this number. So here, when you separate that, is the net open ocean uptake is about 1.4, 1.2 far different from 1.6. The key is to have a release in the coastal ocean. Now the sign is just opposite from what we talk, people use atmosphere centered or ocean centered. In this case, just look at the direction. So, uh, Coastal ocean should release about a total of 0.3 petagram carbon each year. But we know very well now continental shelf is a sink of CO2. So where, you know, about 0.2. So where that 0.3 petagram carbon release can happen, it can only happen in uh, estuarine, right? And very near shore zone. So that become very tricky. What is the boundary between land and ocean? So that's one question uh, our community really needed to, to look into whether there is this large amount, 0.5, looks like, you know, I just said, stream release 0.5, but it's not that uh, uh, simple. There are other questions uh, why this really matters. What this paper talk about is because there is this time difference, CO2 have a, Residence time, air exchange about six months to a year. So CO2 come out from terrestrial, get decomposed to the organic matter and CO2. This is the total flux, by the way, organic and inorganic that goes back to atmosphere. But carbon-13 has a longer residence time of almost you know, 10 years. So that signal can mix into the deep ocean. So this paper, it's a modeling paper, basically say without such without such negative carbon coming from uh, the land, ocean delta C13 will be 0.2 to 0.3 too high. But uh, we've heard of such a theory in the past, like when people talk about age of DOC, right? You could have other source of just very little amount like patchouli input, for example, or other input uh, from uh, uh, seeps with very little amount of DIC, but a very, very negative delta C13 could meet that. But anyway, uh, these just provide a new source, tell us there are still questions 
And, but, uh, you know, that paper is not just about this. It, it has to show us a lot of uh, good argument and uh, just, you know, we need a further study. And so that is another problem. Another question this paper raised is really, it's about open ocean. There's no Delta C sorting collect in coastal ocean. And that is something our group right now are doing, approaching the, uh, approach this question the East Coast. And uh, another new idea come from Jack Middleberg's review paper. Now this is slightly different. Jack talk about inorganic carbon input and also this is in alkalinity unit. So alkalinity twice uh, by you know, uh, inorganic in that case for alkalinity. And also the unit is teramol per year. This is a pedogram, so you need a convert that. What uh, the main point I want to talk is, uh, in the traditional view of the DIC flux in alkalinity unit is much smaller compared with, with what we know that's buried in the ocean. And there are all sorts of theory like groundwater input. And so Jack uh, Middleberg summarized all these and still find, find that there's not enough to count that kind of difference. So he brought in this uh, PIC flux. Now it's not that we don't know their PIC, particularly in organic carbon, but in the past, we consider that part as mostly inert, not really reactive. Uh, so uh, he brought that into the picture. And I think the Delta C13 will be something very useful constraint because this is almost uh, zero, right, carbonate and the organic carbon is very negative. So one should be able to use this as a very powerful tracer to look into this. So that would be something uh, I'm interested uh, to work on. And so that's pretty much, you know, the introduction. Uh, I should stop here, but uh, I want to quickly uh, mention some of my own research along this coastal carbon issue. So that was our group's uh, first period we work at Sapporo Island because I was a faculty member in Georgia and Sapporo Island and the coastal rivers in, uh, in Georgia is really a very good uh, uh, system to look at. So I first started with two rivers, Otamaha and there's another one south here called Satilla in that 1998 paper. And we found the CO2 was huge in the estuary, okay? And the flux is very large, and apparently they are not from the river. They are mostly from the salt marsh, you know, DIC and organic carbon DOC come from the salt marsh uh, to support that flux. And they don't really seem to go very far. So this is a you know, mixing curve you see in the marsh, the low salinity even have higher DIC. And that was in my uh, annual review paper. And I was quite young, taking sample of the marsh. That's my first student, uh, Alec Wong, who is now uh, a very famous person in doing uh, coast uh, marsh export study at Woods Hole and uh, uh, developed some very uh, impressive tools for that. And then we went out for uh, seasonal surveys offshore. And that was Li Qing, uh, he, we are all very young then. And this is Dr. Wang, uh, who built up all the instruments in my lab. And this is Xiang Hui, who visited uh, my group uh, lab at the time. So we actually found out uh, that uh, South Atlantic by the was a moderate or relatively weak sink, okay? It's, it's warm, you know, and uh, feed by all the terrestrial carbon input, but it's still a small CO2 sink. And uh, so that's our early work in the South Atlantic by, and then we have collab in collaboration with NOAA people put a CO2 uh, and you know, now called ocean acidification monitoring station. And since uh, summer of, yeah, uh, 2006, and this is atmospheric CO2, this is water CO2, the blue color. 
And you see, uh, when we rushed to publish our first paper, we saw a huge CO2 increase rate, much faster than atmospheric CO2 increase. But a few years later, the rate was sort of, you know, decrease a little bit or not increase much once if you consider uh, uh, the whole period. And then when you look at more recent data, it's still increasing a little faster than the ocean, uh, than the atmospheric CO2. So the, uh, the bottom line is when you look at coastal CO2, it's very much linked to the, uh, the water cycle. So we have dry year, wet year, then the carbon sent out. So the mooring site is somewhere outside here. So it's reflected as a terrestrial export and the ocean interaction. So we are keep working on that with uh, Janet's work here. And uh, yeah, yeah, I saw him here. She, yeah. Okay, so then uh, after the South Atlantic Bite work, we moved to the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see the Mississippi River plume come out and, uh, you know, a very big CO2 sink along the plume. And uh, we did this uh, 07, 07, before we got any funding. So we just heading there and then we got funded by NSF. And I work with Steve Lorenz and uh, we, we, yeah, I'm going to talk about that later, uh, which, and it's during Wei Zheng Huang's thesis work. He's now a professor at the San Yixin University in Taiwan. And before we publish any surface CO2 flux, we actually publish a paper on the bottom word acidification and Xi Jinping was the main person uh, did that work. So that's Xi Jinping and that's myself and this is Steve and that's Wei Zhen. So uh, we continue now actually to do synthesis of Gulf of Mexico work. And my main focus, our main focus is to assessing the regional SACO2 flux variability and the trend. And we start with Gulf of Mexico because right now we have a good survey here and we see their band of you know, CO2 sink. This is the flux, okay, in the Northern part and uh, that's Northern Gulf of Mexico with the Mississippi River. And you see a very large CO2 release from the Campeche Yucatan uh, shelf in Mexico here and also a little bit of area in South Florida. And what's interesting is when you are a very strong CO2 source or a very strong sink, the annual variability is actually seasonal variability is small. And what is the other area which is less of a source or sink, you see a very large variability. This may be true or maybe partly because of, you know, data limitation, but we know the Northern part quite well. And uh, so we will apply the same approach here. Actually, uh, we first compare with several different data sets, including this machine learning, satellite and machine learning work and uh, numerical model work. So we act, this data here is based on this machine learning package from Chuan Hu's group. And we want to apply the same approach to the US East Coast. And we've done a good preparation with many, many crews since 2007, GOMAC 1, 2012, GOMAC 2, 2015, East Coast Acidification, ECOWA 1, and 2018, ECOWA 2. This is our fearless uh, group leader, uh, Joe Sosbury of uh, uh, New Hampshire, University of New Hampshire. And uh, we've been doing this, uh, building regression models for surface and subsurface water. This is uh, Yuan Yuan. Uh, she is now a poster with Rick and she publishes a paper recently on you know, last uh, few decades of CO2 reconstruction uh, in the South Atlantic Bight and the Mid Atlantic Bight in the in East Coast. And my new, well, not that new, more current student, Xin Yu Li is doing this uh, multiple linear regression model to develop, uh, so estimate CO2, pH, and omega for all these transects. And our goal, the next step, step is to uh, link all these clues plus uh, uh, 
ocean margin program data in 1996 that uh, Doug Wallace collected uh, uh, 20 some years ago. And we want to look at anthropogenic CO2 increase and, and the preliminary data looks quite uh, uh, encouraging. It's also Xin Yu, part of Xin Yu's work. And then uh, one of the last, and not the least is our work in the Chesapeake Bay. So that add a different dimension of the estuarine uh, CO2 research. This is Jane, uh, my first PhD student in uh, Delaware here. And this is uh, Jian Zhong. Uh, and uh, this is our group leader, uh, Jeremy Tester and uh, Bao Sang, who led uh, quite a few of the cruises and published this nice PCO2 paper and estimate CO2 flux uh, in the entire uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay. And you can see these upper bays are source of CO2, but in the middle bay, they are very, very strong sink, very low PCO2, and they change uh, you know, rapidly over different season and uh, uh, sometimes even over storm when you see a few days apart of two track of red color and blue color. And so this year, 2016, when we did a survey, it was a dry year. So the overall the bay, a strong source in the upper bay. And when you put the lower bay, it's uh, overall, it's still a source, but uh, almost zero. But uh, we predict uh, in a wet year, maybe it will become a large, you know, a CO2 sink. And so in the uh, time when I did this annual review paper, globally, when you put the CO2 together, most estuarine CO2 are very, very high. So they are source of CO2. And this is a paper by uh, Borges and Abril. They put a global air sea CO2 flux in estuarine, just to rank them. And the global mean is 26 more carbon per meter square per year and the uh, media is 21. So somewhere uh, here, okay? And, but when you put the Delaware, Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay together, the upper stream, if you consider the bay as a mini ocean, you know, the other part, upper part that is like an stream, not different from other small stream. Right here at the, you know, mean of the global mean really. But when you consider the lower bay, uh, the entire bay, the flux is very small or could be even a sink of CO2. So I haven't been able to, I just put this here, but uh, uh, you know, we need to work with other people with a global uh, data set. Um, really it's uh, how do we extrapolate to uh, you know, how important of the large estuary in the global one. But uh, here's another, work by uh, Ninja's group to show these, this is Delaware, this is Chesapeake and some other uh, Narragansett Bay and other east, large east coast Bay, they're all uh, autotrophic versus some other data in European stream and in Southeast. So they are likely a CO2 sink or a very small source. And uh, or the system is autotrophic, but of course it also affected by river input. And so it could still be a CO2 source, but as a time goes by, I predict we will become a sink. So that took uh, quite a bit of time for the introduction, to, way too long. So I'm going to move first of the uh, main talk part. So we see that I want to, for years, I want to compare the uh, Mississippi River, Northern Gulf of Mexico with the East Changjiang and East China Sea. The question I ask is what, what can we learn from the similarity and differences of these two systems in particular, the 30 years of time difference in the development of the two regions. That looks really interesting to me. And you see the sites of you know, are similar in the two drainage basin, maybe a little high, larger for the Mississippi uh, than the Changjiang, but the discharge is larger for Changjiang. And the nutrient load, that paper, this is from any review paper of uh, uh, Kaja and uh, test, uh, Jeremy Test. They put uh, Mississippi as higher than Changjiang, and I think that may be based on old literature. So when I put the new result, they are, the Changjiang is, is 
greater the nitrogen loading because it's keep increasing. And, and at similar, okay, I would say the hypoxia zone, uh, Mississippi, Northern Gulf of Mexico is still much larger, but the Changjiang East of China Sea is increasing. What I see a major difference in the hypoxia sickness uh, in the Northern Gulf of Mexico, it's only barely four meters and the East of China Sea is 25 meters. And there are difference in water residence time. You could see it's much more dynamic in the East China Sea and the water res respiration, sediment, uh, ox uh, oxygen consumption. These data could be variable. I don't really know whether this is really, there is this difference in the respiration rate. And anyway, it would be interesting to see what really makes the difference and uh, this is a fi uh, figure present, uh, prepared by Steve, my collaborator, Steve Lorenz. And you can see the, this is discharge and the nutrient. The nutrient flux has been stabilized in a rapid increase from 1960 to 80s and then stabilized in the Mississippi. And this is more recent work by modeling work from Han Jin Tian's group. And you can DIN and it's been you know, very stable over the last uh, three decades and TON flux. But uh, uh, in Changjiang system, actually there is a 30 years delay and rapid increase uh, since 1980s when the country opened up and the stabilizing the 20s, yeah, in recent two decades and uh, maybe it's decreasing. We don't know yet, this is uh, one quick. Uh, so, there is one big difference in the Mississippi. You have water discharge, sediment discharge, both stabilized over the uh, last few decades. In the Changjiang, water flux is more or less stable, uh, but there is this rapid decrease of sediment supply, even before the Three Gorges Dam filled. Okay? And this is the 1999 flooding, big flood events. People on my generation remember that vividly. And uh, so I want to ask what is this, you know, pos possible influence by this difference of water versus sediment, stay more stable water versus sediment uh, decrease. So this is a record of historical record of hypoxia from uh, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico from Nancy Rebelus and uh, Jean Turner's work. And there are changes, but uh, overall, it's, there's really not a trend. But uh, in the East China Sea, uh, there is this increase, although it's harder to know whether the early survey is uh, reliable, but it is based on Winkler titration data, so it can't be that bad. What is not questionable is really here, Nancy did it uh, consistently. Here is just different crews, different people, and they may not survey the whole area. But uh, this is the one I really called me the summer 20, 20, 2016, the maximum massive hypoxia and even anoxia. And there's little hypoxia in the last few years. So I want to quickly present uh, uh, a few figures of my own research in this uh, Gulf of Mexico in summer 2017, mainly want to point out this year we had lots of hurricanes. And I just want to talk about this one. Uh, in July, we went out for our cruise, this is Mike and uh, Zhong Pei again, Najid and uh, Bao Zhang and uh, Li Qian. So that July, we actually, mid July, we saw two hypoxia zones of Mississippi and of Achefraya, okay? And only, you know, right after our cruise, it's Nancy's cruise. And she measured this complete, you know, connected hypoxia. So very rapid increase. Okay, that's still one of the largest hypoxia recorded. Okay, so, uh, I'm going to yeah show this. Uh, this was right before our cruise. This is Kajafeno's numerical model result. But then there is this tropical storm Cindy and it just break out. And then 
during my cruise, you can see the numerical model also show a, a non-hypoxia in the between and two hypoxia zones on both sides. And then the 10 days later, yeah, the continuous hypoxia for, for Nancy's cruise. So numerical model shows that. And uh, let's see, do I have a, uh, I'm going to skip the, the movie clip. So there are very rapid uh, changes in hypoxia and the same actually goes on in the East China Sea, Changjiang East China Sea system. And I, I, I will show that uh, later, but here quickly, I want to mention this rapid, you know, Mississippi, Achafalaya, ocean and member. So very rapid removal in the mixing of DIC and high pH controlled by that. And when we apply a three end member model to river and ocean uh, surface water, and because it's strongly stratified, so we didn't put the uh, subsurface water as end member. And this biological DIC removal really controls this delta pH difference. Okay. And uh, that's in Zongpei's uh, paper in this uh, JGR ocean. Okay, and then there's a very good correlation between bottom water oxygen consumption and pH increase DIC release, okay, with the surface pool. And that's when we build up this relationship between DIC and AOU, the biological component, and the delta pH biological component with AOU. And then we can use this relationship to pre back calculate the pH during the cruise. We didn't go that with Nancy's cruise. So this is uh, bottom oxygen convert into DO, uh, AOU and then plus this pH AOU relationship, we can back calculate this. With this and plus historical CO2 change information, we hope to calculate the pH of this last 30 years record Nancy had with bottom water oxygen. Although this, I'm talking about this for three years and still hope one of the motivated young people person could lead the paper to write that. And uh, Zongpei, if you are out there, working on it. And uh, this was a, a PH, you know, this paper we published in Nature Geoscience to show that there is this in, enhanced ocean acidification between oxygenated water and the, hypoxia water, that's because this is from pre-industry to today, and there is an increase, we call that enhanced, and from today to the future, called enhanced ocean acidification. That is because of this biological release CO2 amplify the signal of the atmospheric CO2 from the oxygenated low CO2 water to the oxygen depleted high CO2 water. So you the CO2 has less buffer capacity and greater pH decrease. And 10 years past, we have a lot more data. That was 2007, right? Data 2009. So we want to see if there's a trend in the pH change, bottom water pH. Unfortunately, I don't really see a real trend. And, but we do see at the year with greater hypoxia, you see the stronger great hypoxia and you know larger hypoxia area. Actually, that will translate a longer time for the center of hypoxia. So you see additional pH decline, additional omega, and we figured it must come from Bensic signal. And uh, we, we took the Bensic flux from, well, we have some measurement ourselves with our collaborator and also uh, Will Bellison's uh, work, I didn't know uh, anyway, it was good. Well, we'll, we'll group with there. So that flux, you have a ratio of DIC to alkalinity, benzic, benzic flux to be greater than the bottom water ratio of the, you know, DIC to alkalinity. So that actually acidify the water further. So when you have longer hypoxia and uh, even with anoxia, you will you know, bring this further down. Okay, so that's the Hongjie. Uh, my postdoc, uh, she's now happily working PME. Uh. Okay, so I mentioned this rapid hypoxia change in the uh, uh, 
Northern Gulf of Mexico that actually also happened in the East China Sea when you see this you know, hypoxia and storm come and another hypoxia appears okay, quickly. And the best example was from 2016. And as I said earlier, you know, Nancy, uh, Nancy Rebels have this regular survey in Northern Gulf of Mexico, but in China, it depends on who is there. Uh, Fortunately, in recent years, and Jen Fan Chin's group go survey this, this area every year. And uh, then there are other group, uh, you know, there's only this, this much of coastal ocean in China, right? So other group actually there. So this year, there are two group, Wei Dongzai and Xianghui Guo was there, just uh, the cruise before, the same vessel actually, two times, August, early August and mid and late August you know, two weeks apart, 10 days apart. And these, the difference is warm up, SST, and very, very low wind speed. That summer was, was you know, there's no typhoon. Every other summer you have two or three typhoon in the East China Sea, but not that summer. So there is this massive development of hypoxia. So in the first uh, cruise, hypoxia area was small. 5,000 uh, square kilometers, and 10 days, two weeks later, it become 22 approaching, you know, uh, Gulf of Mexico, and they didn't do another transect, otherwise it could be even larger. So you see the development of hypoxia, uh, both expanding in the area and the thickness of that, you see from here to here, right? And uh, you know, this actually, because they are not the same transect, this will be more comparable to this. Expanding and very thick uh, uh, depths. So there is also a good coupling between surface uh, DO, high DO and bottom, you know, so, and consumption and the delta silicate uh, removal in the surface and release in the bottom and they also identified 90% species like diatoms of the organic matter, okay? Um, so we want to uh, ask uh, why there is this massive hypoxia and compare with historical uh, information to look at how anthropogenic climate change may contribute to the hypoxia in the East China Sea. And uh, so here are some more reliable more recent data, 2006, 20, 2009, 2013, 14, 16, you see hypoxia become greater and greater. And uh, this actually after that, it seems uh, with last few years, no real big hypoxia. So not only the size, but also the, you know, the, the depths become deeper, uh, I mean, thicker, the, of hypoxia zone, the depths from early to more recent data. So this is again back to 2016 of the major hypoxia and the first ever anoxia, we actually smelled hydrogen sulfide and no basic organism and uh, this outside, you can still see uh, organism. And the difference of this year is a little warm temperature sea surface temperature is warm and the lower wind, there's no typhoon, I said, and a little bit of higher uh, river discharge and nutrient supply, of course. But uh, uh, there are other events, particularly in yeah, 98, you have a much larger discharge. So we will ask why. So one thing we found out was, so this is the river discharge, you know, you have two very high discharge 2016 and 1998. And they are actually two, right after two major El Nino events, okay, all positive index. And uh, sea surface temperature is high and wind speed one year is lower than average, the other is a little higher. And uh, then nutrient supply, of course, both are high, but uh, there's no hypoxia in 98, that year was just a huge historical record uh, flooding and a huge hypoxia. Now, what 
others contribution other than SST wind and uh, river discharge. And that bring me back to the sediment the contribution. There is a big change in sediment supply of the river. And again, this is the Mississippi, you know, as a reference, and this is Tanjiang. And whether this reduced the sediment supply could contribute to that. We know with less sediment supply, the turbidity will decrease. So water transparency benefit the biological production, right? So we want to go to satellite. This is the, uh, Suji and she produced this use of two satellites from 1998 and 2012. And the uh, warm color shows the increase rate of chlorophyll concentration. And uh, in the entire, you know, this side of Asia continent, uh, margin, ocean margin, there are a large increase. Now, when we put the uh, data all the way to 2020, uh, it become less conclusive, the outside is still increase, but uh, that's because you have at three satellites, they all are somewhat different. We don't really sure how to uh, calibrate that, but uh, this is the period you have most of sediment decrease, you see. Uh, and uh, so, so we'll make a story based on this first. And uh, you see the sediment decrease in Huanghe, now he's here, you have both sediment and water decrease. So this large increase probably is eutroph eutrophication from the development of the area, not necessarily the river because the river flux become much smaller both in water and sediment. This is Tanjiang decrease. And this is Pearl, Pearl River, also big sediment decrease because lots of dams, Paul can tell you how many in each case. And Mekong, you have large sediment decrease too. So I think at least they are consistent. And I haven't walked, looked at this side yet. And uh, so one thing we did is we tried to look at the you know, chlorophyll intensity. But again, I said, uh, because of three satellites, sea waves, MODIS, and uh, this third one, they are not really tell us the same thing when if we only look to 2012 that seems uh, you know good uh, uh, consistency if I directly look at the uh, intensity but there's one thing we figured we could look is a maximum chlorophyll location so we took a uh, one degree uh, band from 31 to 32 and actually we also did it from with a two degree uh, is and we look at the we you know, add all the chlorophyll together, and we also did the area. You know, we integrated, and then we also look at the maximum chlorophyll location, see how it changes. And the blue color is the sediment decrease. But overall, there is this correlation. Seems like in recent year, the maximum chlorophyll occurring center, you know, is move more near shore. Okay, this is that 1990. Uh, eight, uh, yeah, flooding. So this is July, this is August, but the sediment is annual. So we need to do a more detailed work next by putting uh, monthly sediment, uh, and, you know, to look at it. And also we need some further work on how we really look at the chlorophyll and how we calibrate different satellite data together. So. But that is encouraging. So I hope uh, someone out there uh, listened to this, want to join me, maybe we can work on these together. For example, whether numerical model could help with when you have reduced the sediment uh, supply, was that uh, you know, promote biological production in the field and was that move when you are, you know, the difference is when you are move this to more near shore in this system, you, uh, that actually make a big difference to the hypoxia because the organic matter export was be more focused here rather than spreading out. Okay, and that was uh, Kaja Fano's model shows that just uh, like 25% of reduce in nutrient, for example, but uh, uh, when you move this uh, turbidity uh, center or transparency or this high chlorophyll center in and out and make a big difference. 
So uh, I am uh, approaching 55 minutes limit. And uh, so this is a summary and take home messages. Uh, while there are major progresses in air water CO2 flux studies in continental shelf, we figured the continental shelf is a sink of atmospheric CO2, about 0.2 petagram carbon per year, and in the S train, about release CO2, about 0.5 or 0.3 between that petagram carbon per year. So this has been achieved in the last two decades. Uncertainties are still quite large, in particular, uh, the spatial temporary change, like in some area, like tropical area, we still lack of sufficient data, and in polar area, right? And the estuarine is a big question, particularly when we look at large estuaries, they have much less, you know, much more autotrophic and much less uh, CO2 release or even uptake CO2. So we need to take that into consideration. Bottom, high, bottom water hypoxia and acidification may develop rather rapidly in dynamic coastal waters influenced by large rivers. I showed an example uh, of the Changjiang and the uh, uh, East China, Changjiang East China Sea and the Mississippi and Northern Gulf of Mexico example, right? Both are highly impacted by uh, you know, anthropogenic change while we have this global climate change. And the third point is this more speculative, but uh, that's something I think uh, is interesting to work on. It's rapid riverine sediment reduction in Southeastern Asia over the last three decades due to dam building. And it could be in Mississippi way before that, right? Could it be a major factor in addition to nutrient induced eutrophication and hypoxia and bottom acidification. So I think yeah, that is something I'm, I'm right now excited to try to make some progress. And uh, I want to thank many, many people in my group and uh, in hope, you know, with Dr. Wang who built all the instrument, the lead many, many early cruises uh, when I was in Georgia and uh, many, many graduate students, I counted 16 PhD students, uh, well, PhD masters, I mean and many postdocs and numerous visiting scientists that contributed to this and uh, lots of collaborators, Steve Lorenz and, and Nancy Rebrus and Lu Ying and now Ken Ching and uh, Kaja, we work on the Mississippi together. Oh, uh, actually uh, Courtney as well. And then Jen Fang and others in the East, Tanjiang East China Sea. And we worked with Ming Han and uh, his group in the uh, Paul River system, and now with Jeremy Ming Li and Chesapeake, and uh, Pierre and uh, Guva and uh, Ray Ninja and the General Coastal Carbon Cycle Research, and uh, Rick and Dick on uh, CO2 and OA Research, Warning Cough and Philly, of course. And I want to thank uh, funding agency, Chemical Oceanography and the NSF, and the Ocean Certification Program, NOAA. And uh, thank you for listening. Oh, great, we doing uh, such a, such a great overview and review talk. That's fantastic, and you have a such a, a great collection of that set. Uh, it's amazing you accumulate such a great uh, 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 you know uh, work to put them together. And I also amazed that you uh, uh, persevered in pursuing this. Uh, issues uh, in the last 25 years in, in Georgia, from the small river in Georgia, all the way Chesapeake Bay and uh, Gulf of Mexico and the east coast of US, and even including compared with Changjiang and the Yangtze. That's a great, it's amazing. So if you have any question, raise your hand. And uh, so I know uh, Bob, uh, Bob is already raised the hand. Go ahead, Bob. Yes, uh, great. Great talk, uh, Wedge, and really enjoyable. Uh, I'm wondering about the uh, dynamics of the bottom layer oxygen in particular that you showed. And you, when you were talking about benthic um, oxygen uptake, you gave figures like 20 millimoles per meter squared per day uh, uptake. 
uh, sediment oxygen consumption. But the drawdown rate that you require to uh, have that kind of dynamic change in the two week period uh, can't be explained by that kind of uh, value. So I'm wondering what drives the drawdown rate? I mean, is it in the water column of the bottom, bottom water, or, or do you think that the, there's a misrepresentation or measurement of actual benthic uptake? <clears throat> I, I think, uh, yeah, Christoph did some, uh, you know, basic measurement in the uh, Mississippi system. And uh, uh, actually, we also did some incubation. And uh, Will Bellison had some, but uh, only when your hypoxia time is long enough, like uh, more than a few weeks, the basic uh, part seems to make a big contribution. Mm -hmm. Or at least in the Changjiang system, I think it's much more dynamic than the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And uh, seems like a water column is still uh, more important in, in Changjiang because of the water depths. But there's one thing I didn't talk here. We find lateral transport in the Mississippi from our 2017 work. Hypoxia actually occurs in more near shore first. There you have a lot of organic matter uh, sinking and then actually the migrate along the uh, uh, along the this coast, you know the the bottom actually coming out. So the hypoxia actually move out uh, from the more near shore zone going out. Mm -hmm. And actually, you see this this so called subsurface. Uh, uh, you see that uh, plume. Yeah. Actually, there is this shoot out of you know the red color. Uh, low oxygen water actually move out. And, uh, and th that was really exciting. And I worried about my time. So I deleted this uh, later last night. Uh, it's really interesting. So there are very strong uh, respiration and organic matter in very near shore part. And that could actually come out. That initialize hypoxia. And I think the same happens in the uh, East of China Sea system is when the plume moves, it actually carry, you know, plume moves, carries the organic matter supply, and then the bottom water also moves, but the bottom water move is not that fast to explain this very rapid, uh, you know, very rapid uh, moving from between this close to this. We did a calculation, it's not fast enough that oxygen in the East China Sea case so that mostly is organic matter sinking and decomposition to the bottom water. I don't know if I answered that, but a years ago when you gave a talk, I asked you, you know, you have, you know, where is the most exciting place to make that comparison? You told me, Changjiang, go to do that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that was inspiring, Bob. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, so Thanks. next, Christoph, next, and then after Christoph, uh, Zhu Feng. Okay, Christoph. Just, uh, hi, we're doing very interesting talk and very nice talk uh, as usual, uh, I would say. Uh, one question, you revised the, the CO2 flux uh, from the, the coastal zone, the, the continental shelf, and, um, and from the like inner part, like the estuarine part. Um, in your numbers, like the, the number, the new number, like you do the, that you quote for for the continental shelf was minus uh, 0 0.2 uh, petagram per year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, do you do you mean the 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 anthropogenic carbon or do you mean the? No, these are all contemporaneous. So the net flux we yeah measure the net flux, not anthropogenic, because we can here we don't know what exactly is the. Uh, you know, the, uh, the anthropogenic part, right? On global, people can do that. Here, it's, it's mostly uh, interesting. This won't come up. Anyway, so these are the uh, ba synthesis based on measured data. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, not, uh, not uh, anthropogenic or natural, it's just the net result. Okay. Cool. Um, Zhu Feng, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, 
Professor uh, Wei Jin Cai, I'm Professor from Second Institute of Oceanography. Uh, it's a very nice talk, and uh, I'm a physical oceanography, so uh, probably I'm, my question is uh, probably very, very uh, simple. My question is I, uh, I saw um, uh, many cases in your slides that estuary is uh, uh, on average is uh, uh, a source of CO2 to, to the atmosphere. Uh, I'm wondering uh, what makes, uh, makes a great difference among uh, uh, different estuaries and uh, why estuary is a, a source of, of a CO2. Well, uh, that's, that's a good, real good question. Really, in the early paper by Borges, he contributed that mostly to the river input because most of the river, the data was from European smaller river. They are heterotrophic, burning organic matter. And uh, so they send the CO2 to the estuarine zone. Now, in my study in the southeastern US, it's really the salt marshes. The wetland, they supply most of CO2 as CO in organic carbon and as organic carbon then respiring estrogen. So most of CO2 flux to degas into atmosphere was really supported by local nearby wetland input. Now that these are smaller estrogen. When you come to large estrogen, even Chesapeake Bay with the salt marsh around it, Delaware Bay with salt marsh they are actually very, very small uh, CO2 sink in, in uh, you know, source, very small source and could be sink. So yes, mo mostly that uh, smaller estuarine are stronger sink and they are supplied by their surrounding environment. So as from ecosystem point of view, they are receiving system. So they are get more organic carbon from other system and burn it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Dave. Okay. Next, uh, uh, so Qinghua, then Dave Dumas. Okay, uh, Paul, Dave has a question. Oh, okay. Dave, you go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my, my question was, um, the continental shelf seems to be a sink for about 0.2 petagrams. Um, I'm wondering if it is behaving as a normal ocean. That is, if you look at the open, open ocean flux and prorate it to the area of the continental shelves, do you get uh, uh, a comparable amount per unit area? And so is the continental shelf looking just like uh, the open ocean within uh, the air? A great question, uh, uh, Dave. Uh, actually, that's exactly what Rick Weininkoff concluded when he did that with his uh, open ocean mind. But, uh, uh, interestingly, when, when you look at global, yes, it's not, it, it is still a little larger uh, proportional in area wise. However, the main reason it looks like just, uh, you know, when you average it to the entire continental shelf, it looks like almost like open ocean in that sense. It was because we canceled out. So when you look at individual coastal ocean, some became a very strong sink, some in the source, and then they cancel out. And uh, so globally, it looks like almost you can extrapolate from open ocean, but that was still have a catch. Is a lot of, you know, we have less from tropical area, which could be, uh, you know, less of CO2 sink or even source. And we have such a strong seasonality in coastal ocean. Do we get enough seasonal represent so these are all questions. So I think the number will continue to change for coastal ocean. The other question I had is where does Jack Middleburg think that the PIC dissolves? Is it in the estuary? Is it in the continental shelf or out in the, the deeper ocean? Where, where, and is there any evidence for where it dissolves? Now, that's my interpretation of reading Jack's paper, and maybe that's, that's wrong, but that's the only conclusion I can come up with is that become uh, active rather than inert. And <laughs> I'll let, is Jack still here? 
Jeff just left. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe he will shoot me an email and say, Wait, you misinterpret my. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, let's do Qinghua. You want to go ahead and ask a question? Yeah, uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, it was a nice, uh, very inspiring uh, uh, talk. Uh, I'm uh, Qinghua Ye from. Uh, and uh, now in uh, the Tars in Netherlands. It was uh, very, uh, very exciting uh, to, to, to join this um, uh, series. I have a small question. Since my background is uh, sediment transport and modeling, so uh, I was very, um, yeah, uh, preliminary knowledge, have preliminary knowledge about these uh, measure, measurements. Uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, there are quite some uh, uh, cruise uh, measurements uh, in the carbon and then, uh, Dissolved, uh, dissolved oxygen in the cru uh, in the cruises. Um, what what is more or less the, the possible uh, error bar or uncertainty uh, in the measurement normally? Is it um, a kind of um, a, a, a kind of a percentage of a milligram per liter or? Are you are you talking about the CO two part or the sediment? the oxygen and the CO2 part. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, the oxygen and CO2 measurement themselves are pretty precise. What is a problem is in the know, water, how I mean. you extrapolate the spatial and you know, temporary, seasonal and temporal extrapolation, extrapolation is a problem. So that was, is one reason that I, I mentioned that my, we are actually going back to, to more basic things. So that's what we did, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico now, uh, yeah. to look at the spatial temporal changer, like in this figure I showed, we want to look at the, the variability and trend. So it's not a measurement uh, issue anymore. Well, still there are places we don't have data or have very okay. poor okay spatial and temporal representation. So it's mm -hmm. really, it's, it's that yeah. problem, not the direct physical okay. Yeah. okay, okay, thanks. And, and another small question uh, um, uh, related to the, the, uh, the, the part you, you, you uh, described in front of the continental shelf of Yangtze estuary. Mm -hmm. um, would uh, the, those uh, ocean uh, currents uh, will play a role there or or not? I mean, just oh, uh, coastal currents. Yeah, for for example, the corrosional currents. Yes. Oh uh, yeah, will yeah. that will that <laughs> play a role? Definitely, there? and uh, we actually work with uh, you know because this work is really what the people in the second institution uh, yeah. oceanography they did that and. Uh, and in the Mississippi, you know, it's clearly the coastal current play a role. Most time when the water come out, it goes that direction, but in later July, it could be pushed back. And the same thing occurred in the East China Sea, the coastal current mm -hmm. make a big difference. And the Zhou mm -hmm. who is here, he, he knows this better. And actually we are collaborating to interpret this result together with his numerical okay. model. Okay, cool, great. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Weijun, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, about the sediment, the role of sediment control, the Im implication, the impact to the body chemical. So uh, one thing, you know, after listening to your talk, I, I suddenly realized, besides this could be promote the primary production, I mean, the sediment reduction, but also at the same time, they could also promote the burning rate because you know, assume the same amount of nutrient to dump out the river, but less sediment, less turbid, turbid. I mean, the burning rate, that means the CO2 release that be enhanced could be. Is that right? Uh, that could, could be, but uh, you know, in long term, the burning of the terrestrial carbon you know, that could make a difference how, where you deposit the organic. But, uh, Mostly when you look at the DIC produced from organic matter decomposition, most of the areas they are actually locally produced the marine source organic matter. So yeah. for 
for depending on what angle, if we look at a hypoxia, I would say probably not because that's within very short time scale. It has to be a process very rapidly to consume oxygen. But uh, in a global carbon cycling view, uh, because you know, most of the river actually bring carbon from middle latitude to lower latitude and at warm temperature, you can decompose more terrestrial organic carbon. Uh, and now where as the sediment uh, supply decrease, there probably less oh. POC supply. So that will make the, the, a difference in when we consider global budget. Mm -hmm. and so, so uh, may, may not be the terrestrial carbon, but definitely the marine, the newly fresh uh, marine carbon could be burning faster. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I mean. But when you have the, this biological production center need, moved more near shore because of less, because of increased the transparency, less sediment supply. And so there you the organic matter production could be more near shore. And when that occurs, it tends cause uh, bottom water hypoxia and acidification and uh, stronger because the shallow depths mm -hmm. yeah. and the more near shore, yeah. Okay, cool. Any, any other question? So uh, if not, it's already 10, 10, 16 a.m. We doing that's a great talk and thank you, thank you so much. I think, you know, uh, I need to uh, watch your talk a couple more times and it's so informative. Is a, is a great, great. Keep going on. And I saw the SETA image. If you uh, if you see that SETA image of a crawfer A, could you could you put that slide? And if you look at the offshore of the Mekong and the Euro, uh, the, uh, no, the in front, yeah, this one. Look at the Andaman Sea. Look at the you know in Andaman Sea. You know where that here. Look at the such a high density. And suppose here is a very high tepid water, but uh, looks like the curve E also very high. That's something we need to look at that. And well, also- Good, I get you excited. So we'll continue the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so then we should never retire. <laughs> <laughs> Still lots to do. Uh, okay. Well, David, uh, Bob, Ella, they are all here. We're too early for us to talk about retirement, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, great, great. Thank you, okay. Paul, thank uh, you. I really okay, I, I see you, see you uh, next, uh, and, uh, next week, and uh, particularly next Friday, I mean the, oh, oh gosh, where's my? Oh, should uh, I? Uh, yeah, I'm um, share first, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, you're okay, you're okay. So I just, Oh, yeah, you know, I just uh, see next week and please come to uh, Bernard to talk same thing about Mississippi River in organic water comes to train. <laughs> that would be very good, you know, uh, a big a back pick of your talk. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so thank, thank you, you very much. Sure. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>